Uh, you enjoying this series, Se season two? Yeah? Um, I saw, if you've seen this, now, how many of you have, like, watched all the way to what they've got so far through th season three? Yeah. And I saw the other day the previews to season four. Wow. Have you seen those? Yeah, Raising of Lazarus. So, um, and a lot of other really good stuff. But uh, anyway, good to have you with us this morning. Uh, a happy or a blessed um, uh, Reformation Day to all of you. And so uh, we'll go ahead and get started. And let's, let's go ahead and open with prayer. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this day in which we celebrate your word, Lord, the truth of your word, and we stand by that truth, even though everything around us is changing, Lord, you are unchangeable, and so are your promises to us. Bless us this day as we, we look at uh, season, uh, episode four of season two of The Chosen, and especially uh, what that means to us, um, uh, according to the words of scripture, that, uh, uh, that it illuminates who Jesus is is and what he has done for us. In Jesus' name, amen. So first of all, any questions just overall about anything, like maybe episode one or anything? Okay. Well, episode two, then we start with this young boy. And this goes on for like 10 minutes, right? So, and there's no speaking or anything, but this one, this young boy, Jesse, we learn later that his name's Jesse. And, you know, he, he went and climbed a tree and fell and, and was injured, no longer able to walk. And he, he grows up and sees everyone else around him is kind of getting on with their life, but he's kind of shut out as a cripple. And so he can really only watch these kids play from the sidelines. And, and he has a younger brother, Simon, uh, who helps him out. Uh, and, you know, as they grow up, they see the cruelty of the Romans, uh, which was, I mean, it was very evident um, to those living at that time. You know, uh, crucifixions, I mean, they were public events, and, you, you know, you'd, you'd see uh, people being crucified right along the roads and, and so forth. And, but uh, uh, so... His younger brother is really disturbed by this, and he eventually becomes a zealot, right? Um, so who were the zealots? Anybody know who the zealots were? Okay. So they're uh, Israelites fighting against the Roman occupation, right? The Romans really looked upon them as terrorists. Um, but the Israelites regarded them as kind of misguided patriots. You know, so um, anyways, uh, of course, we know later, this is, he's Simon the Zealot, right? He's going to be one of the disciples eventually. Um, uh, then shoot ahead a number of years, and we see this lame man sitting beside the pool of Bethsaida. And that, by the way, is directly from John chapter 5. And he's hoping to be healed by the angel that stirs up the waters, right? Um, so according to this pagan legend, there is an angel comes and stirs up the waters, and if you're the first one in the water, uh, you will be healed. Um, so Simon, meanwhile, his brother's there. He kind of hangs out by those waters, and Simon is given the job of killing a Roman magistrate. We learn his, later his name's Rufus. And they're hoping that the death of the magistrate will cast suspicion on Caiaphas, the high priest, uh, whom the zealots don't trust. They, they feel that he's sold out Israel. And his, Simon's, this guy that's training him, uh, he says, carry out your orders, Simon of Zebulun, or never return. Okay. Any questions so far? Any of that stuff that's happened? Okay. So, 
The next scene, then, we see the disciples are preparing for the festival of booths or uh, tabernacles. Uh, and they're, they're busy building this booth. What, what's that all about? What's the festival of tabernacles about? Yes, right. So it's a reminder of the time that God provided for the Israelites while they were, you know, uh, in the desert, in the wilderness for 40 years during the time of Moses, and, and, uh, and, and they lived in tents. And God provided for them, uh, you know, he provided the, the manna and the quail for them, and the, uh, their shoes, nothing, their clothing didn't wear out, and so... Um, but the, the other thing was they lived in these tents. So this was a, it's a great festival uh, that the, the Israelites had. Uh, and you were to go to Jerusalem. Everybody would go to Jerusalem and build these, these little huts, you know, and, uh, and, and live in them uh, for, for the duration of the festival. Um, then we see... So the, so the disciples are there preparing this. And then we see Simon, he walks past this crucifixion scene. And he kind of pauses and looks at it because he knows that if he gets caught, that will be his fate, right? And we learn, too, that a Roman secret service officer named Atticus is, is roaming about the city. Uh, and he's kind of watching for something. Because of the festival, you know, this is a an opportune time for the zealots to strike and so forth. Do the, does this zealots, do they, and I'm not speaking about today, things that are going on in, in Israel and that, but does it remind you of anything from American history? Is there any comparison? During the revolution, right, um, the, the Minutemen, if you, have you seen, uh, what's the Mel Gibson movie? Um, Patriot, yeah. So they would kind of, you know, a, a number of them would the, strike, you know, the, the British army uh, and, and British soldiers and stuff. And if they got, you know, British soldier got cut off from the others, you know, they were in danger of being uh, killed. Uh, they would attack the British, you know, the British marched down the road and the Minutemen would attack them you know, from out of the woods, and then they'd, they'd flee. So very much like uh, our, our Minutemen uh, during the revol revolution, whom the British regarded as terrorists, right? It's kind of your point of view. What, you know, is you're a patriot or a, 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 a terrorist, depending on which side you're, you're fighting on. <laughs> so, um, but, yeah, that's what the zealots were. So, um, then we enter Shmuel, right? And we're all familiar with Shmuel by this time. He's a Pharisee. He's from Capernaum. Uh, and he, knew, he knows about Jesus. He knows about the disciples. And he is there in Jerusalem preaching to people to beware of false prophets. He's basically warning the people against Jesus. And Matthew warns the other disciples that this Pharisee, uh, they, they need to be careful because this Pharisee knows who they are, right? So why does Shmuel think that Jesus is a false prophet? What's that? Okay, they're, they're waiting for, yeah, so, so, yeah, the Jews are kind of um, looking for a Messiah who's a lot like David, right, who is going to be powerful, um, like a king, but even greater than David, and he's going to, you know, defeat the Romans, drive them out of uh, Israel, and Jesus doesn't fit the picture, right? Um, and so he's also doing things that the Pharisees 
didn't agree with. So what are some of the things that Jesus is doing that really upset the Pharisees? Healing on the Sabbath, right? And that's really going to be evident in this episode. Um, you know, they were so obsessive about the Sabbath, how the distance, they had it figured out, besides scripture, they had their own laws, right? The distance you could walk on a Sabbath, the things that you could do on the Sabbath, the things that you couldn't do on the Sabbath. Um, you know, you couldn't cook or anything like that. Um, so you had to prepare your food ahead of time. And you couldn't heal people, which is ridiculous, right? So, and Jesus will later point out, you know, you can, if your donkey falls into a pit on the Sabbath, you can pull them out, but you can't heal a person. It, you know, it, it just, it's an affront to God. You know, because we are to love one another, you know, just as we love ourselves. So, um, and so that's one reason that the um, uh, Pharisees are upset with Jesus. What's another reason? Yeah, yeah, he eats and drinks with sinners, right? He hangs out with sinners, which, you know, uh, and, and even more than that, he, he does things um, that go against uh, Jewish tradition and what some of the Old Testament laws uh, were about touching unclean people. You know, if you touch someone who was sick or if you went into a Gentile's house, um, if you touched a dead body, you know, you were unclean. So then you had to go through the whole process of being cleansed uh, before you could go uh, back to the temple and, and so forth. So um, Jesus went against all of that. You know, Jesus was all about touching people. Uh, you know, he, he, would, he would touch a leper. You know, that was like the, the most revulsion, re, um, revolting thing that a Jew could think of is if you touch a leper because then you're really unclean, right? Plus there's the fear of that you're going to become a leper too and all of that. Jesus didn't care. He touched the lepers and he healed them. He touched, you know, a dead body and raised it from, from uh, death to life. Uh, uh, so, and then he, of course, he hung out with all kinds of people that they would consider unclean. Um, and so it was Jesus purposely did those things to stand up to the Pharisees to let them know they're going down the wrong path here um, because, because they're not loving their brother, right? They think they're loving God by trying to obey all of his commandments. Um, but they are, they, they are not loving one another as well, which is the second you know, greatest commandment. Love the, your God with your uh, whole heart, mind, body, and soul, and love your neighbor as yourself. And they're not. And if you're not loving one another, you're not loving God either. So they've really gone astray. Um... So we got Shmuel there. He's warning the people against the disciples, against Jesus. And Thomas tells, Thomas is there with uh, Thaddeus and Matthew. And Thomas tells another uh, disciple, Thaddeus, uh, <laughs> he's, he says, Matthew bugs me. He's, he's, you know, Matthew's got some idiosyncrasies. And he says, that guy really bugs me. And Thaddeus, he tells him, <laughs> this is kind of funny, that's because you're kind of the same person. <laughs> How are they alike? How are Thomas and Matthew alike? Analytical, yeah, he says, you're all numbers and logic, right? Just like Matthew. Uh, and so then he asks, what are the odds that someone from home, the Pharisee, would find them there in Jerusalem and then Matthew and Thomas actually begin to calculate the odds. You know? So that's the kind of, kind of guys they are. Meanwhile, we have Simon the Zealot, and he's planning the assassination of the official uh, uh, with the others. Uh, and Atticus is, Atticus, this Roman um, watchdog, is, is following Simon around. Okay, 
Any questions to this point about any anything? Okay, yeah, Chris. Yeah, so a lot of that came about, they think, during the Babylonian exile. That's kind of where the party of the Pharisees came. Because remember, what got them in trouble? What got them sent to Babylon to begin with? Because they ignored the law, right? They, they ignored God's commands. Um, and, and so the Pharisees were a party that, that kind of was raised up to make sure the people followed God's law, okay? So then they would debate, and, and so they, all of these questions arose. Well, if you're not supposed to travel on a Sabbath, how, how far can you walk, you know? So then they came up with the Sabbath day's journey. Um, and because um, they realized you might have to go out and, you know, whatever, get water or something. So, so there was a, a certain distance you could walk. They came up with all kinds of rules to make sure that you didn't, um, you know, depart from God's law. You couldn't spit on the Sabbath. This was a debate they had because you might plow up some ground and that would be plowing, right? <laughs> you, they would debate like um, if, uh, let's see, just ridiculous stuff like that. Um, they would debate. And so, um, yeah, so that's where they came up with these. And there was like, I forget, 600 and some, you know, rules that they came up with. Um, so, uh, anyways, Jesus is eating with his disciples in this next scene in, in the booth that they made, which is kind of cool. And, and Mary says the, the tabernacles are a reminder of God's provision when the Israelites were in the wilderness. And so they remember that. And, and James asked Jesus about a passage in Zechariah that says, One day all of the en enemies of Israel shall go uh, with them up on the mountain to celebrate the Feast of Booths and worship the Lord. And he asked Jesus, What will have to happen for such a thing to take place? Because you can't imagine all of, the, all of Israel's enemies are going to be worshiping with them in Jerusalem, and Jesus replies, something will have to change. And the disciples wonder how so many people from all the nations would fit into Jerusalem. And Jesus says, I think it will not be Jerusalem as we know it now. And the others say, it sounds impossible. And then Mary makes a comment uh, that kind of opens everyone's eyes. Uh, do you remember what that was? She says, I know a thing or two about prophecies that sound impossible. <laughs> um, so what, what is Jesus talking about there anyways? This, right. Yeah, he's not talking about earthly Jerusalem, right? He's talking about, um, you know, uh, the heavenly Jerusalem. It's, you know, when in the new creation, all God's people are together. So that there's Jews, you know, there's Gentiles, people from all every nation on earth will be there and we will be worshiping uh, with our brothers and sisters in Christ for eternity. Um, you know, there's some Christians that have the idea that and, and I'm not trying to get political here, I'm, I'm talking theologically, that we should support Israel for theological reasons, okay? Now, there's a lot of reasons what we, we should uh, support Israel, I think, and there's a lot of reasons that we should, um, you know, help the Palestinian people as well, but there's nothing to do with Scripture, right? Um, there's a, what we call millennialists who have... A, misguided notion of the second coming. You know, we believe, and what we believe, this is what scripture says, is that Jesus comes, it's done, okay? So when, when Jesus comes, 
all the faithful are with him in heaven, right? There's no rapture or anything like that. So you, if you die, you're with the Lord. Jesus comes again, you go with the Lord. Millennialists believe that Jesus is going to set up a kingdom. This is kind of going back to the, the Jewish idea of a Messiah. He's going to set up a kingdom in Jerusalem on earth and rule for a thousand years, and which is totally against scripture. And so for that reason, a lot of them think we should, um, by all means necessary, protect Jerusalem and the Israelites and so forth. So um, anyways, it's not about that Jerusalem, right? It's about the heavenly Jerusalem. And that's the point that kind of that Jesus was making. Um, then uh, Peter warns Jesus, oh, any questions about that? I'm sorry, before I just want to drop that on you and then, then leave you. So, okay. Um, Peter then warns Jesus that Shmuel's in town, um, warning people about him. And Jesus asks Peter and John to join him in town tomorrow. He's going to go visit someone there. And he says, oh, and bring Matthew with you as well. Okay. Then the next scene, we have a priest is reading in public from Zephaniah 3, 17 through 20. Would somebody, somebody want to look that up for us? Zephaniah 3, 17 through 20. And we'll read that together. Somebody has it, just raise your hand. Zephaniah 3, 17 through 20. You know, he's one of the minor prophets towards the back of the Old Testament. 15, 17 in the, in the study Bible, in the little blue Bible there. Right, can you read that, Carol? Uh, 17, 3, 17 through 20. <clears throat> Okay, so how does that reading apply to this episode? You see anything in there that relates to what's happening or what's going to happen? Right, so he's going to save the lame and gather the outcast. And so we know... Uh, he's going to Jerusalem to see Jesse, right? So that is, is specifically, that's his reason for going there. Um, and so who are the outcasts then? Okay, that's one, yeah, anybody who's not Jewish, but who else? Any sinner would be an outcast. Okay, so um, yeah, murdering people, that's, that's not a good thing. <laughs> so you're going to be an outcast. Yeah. Right, yeah. Right, yeah, so... The, the people who are at the pool or any person who has any kind of an affliction, right? Uh, so, you know, remember the thinking was that 
if you were born, for instance, with the, the, the man who was born blind. And do you remember that, that account? And Jesus is in, and his disciples are walking by and the man's there and he's begging. And uh, he, he says, uh, uh, Lord, who sinned that this man was born blind? He or his parents? You know, well, that wasn't the case at all. It had nothing to do with anybody that, who had committed a sin. If that was true, we'd all be born blind, right? <laughs> so, because we're all sinners. Um, but that was their thinking, that this God gave people afflictions because of some great sin. Um, and so, so they were all considered outcasts, right? So far, they, they wouldn't, people wouldn't even touch them or anything like that. So, um, so this is looking, speaking specifically about when the Messiah comes. And, you know, Scripture says that he would heal the lame and make the deaf to hear and the blind to see and all of those things. So this section is talked specifically about Jesus' ministry, but then it's also looking ahead to when it's really fulfilled, right, when the Lord comes again and when, he's, when he uh, makes everything new again in the new creation, right? Heaven, uh, if you will. So prophecy does that a lot. So we see where it's fulfilled in one way, but then we see where it's fulfilled in a greater way. Uh, one example would be that uh, God promised to lead his people to the promised land, okay? So what did they think of the promised land? That was Canaan, right? And so Eventually, God did lead his people into the promised land on earth. But where's the real promised land? It's heaven, right? So, so we are looking forward down the road to that. So that's way, one way in which it was fulfilled, you know, uh, in the time of Moses, and then fulfilled, it will be fulfilled in a greater way when, when the Lord comes again. So, um, okay, so... Simon also quoted that passage. This was kind of, uh, there's a flashback here. Simon quoted that very passage uh, in an earlier farewell letter to his brother. And Jesse reads it to him. And so that, he had saved that letter. Jesse had saved that letter. Um, and um, that which, you know, it, it's very obvious that this, passage is, is kind of central to the whole episode. Uh, meanwhile, uh, on their way to the pool, Jesus and others pass a crucifixion scene. What is, do you know, did you notice Jesus at, when they walked by there? What did he do? He was looking, he kind of stops, and he's reflecting on that because he knows that that's his fate, Right? Jesus knew why he came. He came to die for our sins, um, which is, you know, that's really what makes Christmas so powerful is that um, this, this child is born, but he's born to die for us, um, that we might live. And it, that's something that, you know, remember in the gift of the Magi. Well, what did they bring? They brought gold, which signifies that Jesus was uh, a, a king, right? So gold was something that a gift you would give to a king. They brought frankincense. Frankincense was the incense they burnt in the temple, and that signified that he was God. And what was the other thing they brought? Myrrh, and that's what they used to anoint the dead. That signified that Jesus came to die for us. Um, so yeah, so only, you know, you think about, I mean, yeah, Jesus is Lord, but he's human too, and he knows what's coming. And, and um, to, you know, he's kind of like a dead man walking from the time that he's born, and he, and he knows that. And so he stops and he reflects on that. Um, was just the most unimaginable way for, for someone to die. Um, then we see Atticus, and he's warning uh, Petronius, 
against assassins who are plotting against Rufus. And he tells him that Rufus should be changing his routine, not visiting the restaurant that he goes to every Sabbath. He's got this pattern, you know. And, um, and so he says, you gotta, you got to break that routine because they're going to, you know, th- th- you're a target. Um, they're too predictable. Um, and Atticus says that he wants to kill the zealots as they try to execute their plot. So Atticus is there. He's got wind of something's up, and he wants to catch him in the act to show them. Why why does he want to catch him in the act? I'll ask you that. Why does he want to do that rather than break it up ahead of time? To make an example of them, right, to show them that they failed. Your plans have failed miserably so that they, they won't be an inspiration to others to follow in their path, right? Um, And he wants to show them that the Romans were better than them on that day. That we, you know, you can't beat us. We know what you're up to. um, So you might as well just give up. Well, Simon finds, well, Simon's in Jerusalem. and And he goes to the pool and he sees Jesse at the pool. And they haven't seen one another for 25 years. Wow, you know. I had, my wife's grandfather had this brother. His name was Quentin, and he lived in Saginaw. And he asked us to go to this funeral with him. He says, uh, yeah, my brother will be there, and I haven't seen him in 25 years. You haven't? I, what are you, was there like an argument between? No, 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 nothing like that. Just... They just hadn't, he lived in Saginaw, and, and my wife's grandpa lived down here, and they just, they just never saw each other. It's like, how sad is that, you know? But wow, what a, what a reunion that was uh, to see them uh, come together and, and embrace and all that. So here it's been 25 years since Jesse's seen uh, Simon, and uh, Simon has been in and out of Jerusalem, and he knew his brother was there, but he, why didn't he visit him? Do you remember what he said? Well, that was one reason, because it was a pagan spot, right? So, um, and, and um, Simon kind of chastises his brother uh, because of that, but, but also he was, said he was embarrassed for his brother. You know, that he was hanging out there uh, for, for so long. Um, and, um, and so um, Simon tells him that this place is God forsaking, forsaken and has turned my brother into someone who's hopeless. Was that true? Yeah, right. So um, that, that he's been laying there for all that time and no one, there's no way for him to, first of all, get into the pool before everyone else, right? Because he's lame, but also that his hope is in that. And it, it's a, a false hope, right? Um, do we see people like that in this life, hanging on to some kind of false hope? What do you think? Yeah, absolutely. Any kind of false religion, anything you put up above, you know, put your faith in above God himself, you know, the true triune God, is a false hope. What's the biggest false hope we, we put our faith in? Money, that would be one, yeah. The government, okay. Something even bigger than that. Ourself, right? Thinking that there's some, something that we can do to uh, merit heaven, to merit God's forgiveness. That's what the Reformation was all about, right? There's nothing we can do. We're all, Luther says, poor beggars before God. 
We, we have nothing to give. But God has everything to give. Everything. And he, he, he wants to give us all of his blessings, you know, including forgiveness and eternal life and everything that goes with that. His, his grace now in this life, right? His care for us. Um, and so anyways, um, Jesse is, is on to what his brother is about to do, right? He knows he's up to something. He knows he's in there. He's there for some reason. The zealots are going to try something. He says, whatever it is, don't do it. He's trying to talk his brother out of it. So really, Simon has a false hope too, right? What's his false hope? That somehow he and his compatriots, these other zealots, can drive the Romans you know, the greatest power on earth, out of Jerusalem. And that there, there is the thinking too, and the Pharisees kind of think this way also, if everybody can follow the law, uh, the Messiah will come. It will hasten the coming of the Lord. Um, and so they're putting their false hope in themselves and in this this thing that they're trying to do, killing these people. Um, and, of course, you know, that, that doesn't get them anywhere. And, um, and, and it's really, I mean, no different with that fighting, it goes on today. You know, that's really what we see happening in Israel and Gaza is, is you know, terrorist activity, uh, people killing civilians and everything, and, and the Palestinians want their freedom. They want to, you know, they really want Jerusalem, right? And the Israelites say, no, that was ours. It was given to us, you know, by the Lord himself. And so that's what all of that fighting is about. So, yeah, Carol. Right. 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 So you can think back to the time of David. You know, David and they went in and, and um, or even long before that to Gideon, you know. Uh, if you think of Gideon's account and, and, and he had these men who was supposed to defeat his enemies and, you know, the Lord whittled them down till there was just a few of them and they were, were unarmed and, and uh, but... Um, you know, the Lord was victorious because it was in him. The power was in him. The command was from him. Same with David, right? And the, the Israelites who were trying to become a nation. Um, their power wasn't in themselves. It was in the Lord. And it was the Lord doing all of the work for them, really, even though they were, you know, fighting and getting killed and stuff. But it was sanctioned by the Lord, right? As his judgment, they, they were an instrument of judgment upon the, the Canaanites, you know, who were sacrificing children and uh, all kinds of other things. And, and, um, but uh, when you go out on your own and try to do things, you know, and think you, God will back you, um, you know, you're going to be disappointed. So, so, yeah, the point there, Simon is, was misguided as well. So, so Simon is preparing for his mission, and he heads out to intercept Ruth, Rufus and his escort. Meanwhile, Jesus, Peter, John, and Matthew arrive at the pool, and Jesus finds the one he's looking for. Uh, he finds Jesse. And do you remember what, what does Jesus ask Jesse at that time? Do you want to be healed? Why would he ask that? Why would he ask, do you want to be healed? What? Okay, faith, but, but why else, Chris? Okay, that might be part of it. The God knows what our needs are, but he wants us to ask. But maybe could Jesse be content in what he's, that life that he's living? You know, he's getting alms and everything, and, and maybe he's, he's content to just 
continue doing what he's doing. I mean, that's just a thought, right? Um, but um, I, had a, I had a thought there, and then it left me. <laughs> um, so anyways, yeah, Jesus asked him, why does he want to be healed? And then Jesse, he starts making, but, but I can't get into the water. Never mind about that, Jesus says. That will do you no good. But I'm asking you, do you want to be healed? And, and so um, eventually uh, the man acknowledges that, that he does. And oh, oh, that one part Jesus says, you don't need the pool, you only need me. And so anyways, Jesse relents, he nods, and Jesus tells him, okay, pick up your mat and walk. And then you see John in the background, and he's writing all of this down, by the way. Usually it's Matthew writing everything down. Well, this time it's John. And why is John writing it all down? Because it's in the Gospel of John that we find this account, right? So, um, so the Pharisees are watching, because why are they watching? What? Find, find something against them, and it's the Sabbath, right? So uh, anyway, Jesus kind of, he departs, right? And then Shemuel confronts Jesse and the disciples because uh, this man is carrying his mat, you know? And you shouldn't be carrying, you're not supposed to carry anything on the Sabbath. And, and Peter tells him that he's, he's trying to make it that this Pharisee is trying to make it about uh, Shabbat, about the Sabbath, when the man has just been healed, you know? It's like he ignores this miracle. They're so focused on trying to obey the law um, that, that they're missing the larger point that here is a man who has been lame since he was a kid and now can walk. And the, he saw the miracle happen right before his eyes, but he's focused on something else. What does, it, can we relate to that in any way? Okay, Rob, you said yeah? So, okay, so how? Right, exactly, right. So here God has done everything for us. He supplied us with, with everything we need for this body and life, right? Uh, he has given us his grace. Da you know, he gives it daily. Uh, and, and he gives us his, his own body and blood in, in the sacrament. He gives us his word for food to live on, to strengthen our faith. And yet we, we can forget. And we can get sidetracked and focus on the wrong things, you know. Um, and and I, that can happen with me, too. Sometimes... You know, after everything the Lord did for me, and I have this reminder of what the Lord did for me, you know, that's with me all the time, that I can get sidetracked and miss what God is trying to do or forget about what he's done and or, or yet just start worrying about things that, that aren't important um, and focusing on that stuff instead of on all of the good things. Uh, you know, it's kind of like count your blessings, right? Because it's true. Um, the Lord blesses us immensely, and we forget about it. And then sometimes we're, we're focused on our problems or, or things that, and, and petty things, you know. Um, you know, not just big things, but petty things that, um, you know, well, my dishwasher's broke. Now, this is true, by the way, my, our dishwasher died. <laughs> and then... And then I, so we got a new dishwasher. Hallelujah. You know, I can get a new dishwasher. You know, I have the means to do that. It's a nice one. And then they came and they said, well, we can't put it in because you need an extension that goes over to your, you know, your sink and, and you have a cabinet in between. It's like all the stupid things, you know. So now I got to put the stupid thing in myself. <laughs> and so, but, you know, I, I can focus on that and get all obsessive about it, but Hey, you know, the Lord has given me a new dishwasher. I'm, I should be grateful. And um, anyways, um, so 
Shmuel, yeah, okay. Shmuel confronts the disciples about what's happened. And then, then we go back to Simon and the magistrate. And the zealots create this diversion. And we see this magistrate coming. And Simon prepares to strike. He's, he's ready to kill this guy, right? So this guy's other guy started this fire and everything as a distraction. And Simon is just waiting for his moment. And then something happens. What is it? What is it? He sees his brother, and his brother is carrying that mat, right? And so he goes after him. He, he forgets about what he's doing. And he goes after his brother, and he sees his brother, and his brother begins to dance. It's like, wow, this is so, so cool. And they embrace an Atticus, you know, this, this Roman kind of spy guy. He's watching him. And I think he's wondering what happened because their plan, they were, they were about ready to strike and then he just left. And now he's with this guy and the guy's dancing. What happened? Um, and after that, Jesus and the disciples depart. And Simon was pleased to see that the Pharisees were upset. You know, he... Uh, I'm talking about Peter, Simon Peter, and he's, he was really glad that, that Jesus really upset the Pharisees. You know, Jesus is always in the face of the Pharisees, you know, healing, healing people on the Sabbath. He does it on purpose, right? Um, and, and Peter says, it's almost as much fun to see uh, them all upset as the miracle. And then Peter asks, uh, why he did it on the Sabbath. He asked Jesus why he healed him on the Sabbath. And, and then what does Jesus reply? Sometimes you got to stir up the water, right? So, so what does he mean by that? Yeah, okay, so Chris says, is the greater message that we are, should be loving one another? And that is part of the greater message, okay, that, that yes, they, we should, um, you know, be, that should be our focus, but also on who Jesus is and what he can do, right? So, um, yeah, uh, it's, it's in one reason, you know, you don't touch someone that's unclean uh, on the Sabbath and, and because that'll make you unclean for the Sabbath. Um, and being more concerned about that or more concerned about obeying the rules than about people, right? And so Jesus did that all the time, you know, and that's one reason he was confronting them on the Sabbath all the time was because, you know, Jesus said the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. The Sabbath was meant to be a benefit for us to give us a day of rest, right? Not as a, a, some, something that we have to follow to the letter or else. Um, and so we see, in, in fact, in Scripture, David points back to David. Uh, he says, don't you remember it was on the Sabbath that they came into, and this was depicted last season, I believe, when David and his men went into went to um, the temple and they ate the bread of the presence because they were hungry, right? Um, that was something that was only meant for priests, but what was more important was caring for David for caring for his, his men. And so they did that. Another time, Jesus and his disciples are walking through a field and they're, you know, crushing the grain of, of wheat in their hands and eating it. And that was on a Sabbath. And, of course, the Pharisees got on them about that. And that was, that engendered the whole discussion that, you know, Jesus says, I am Lord of the Sabbath, you know. So, uh, and that the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. Okay. Um, other questions? Or thoughts, or yeah. Mm 
Right. Okay, so. That's a really good point. Yeah, so Jesus was kind of usurping the, the authority of the Pharisees by telling the people, you know, the Pharisees were, were to make sure the people followed the law, and Jesus was telling them, no, that's not as important as, you know, loving your neighbor, and so just disregard the law. So Jesus is undermining everything that the Pharisees are trying to do. Um, and what was really the greatest concern of the Pharisees about Jesus? That the whole world would go after him and that he would cause maybe a rebellion or some disturbance in Israel and then the Romans would come down hard on him and the Pharisees would be out of a job, right? They were afraid of losing their position. So Carol... Yeah. Right. So, yeah. So, yeah, that's a really good point. So the Catholic Church in, during the Reformation, they were afraid this upstart priest named Luther was, was undermining their authority, right, and their control of the people, really. And, and, and that's what a lot of it was, was about control, which is why they didn't want the people, first of all, the, the mass was read in Latin and the people didn't understand Latin, right? So, but it doesn't matter. You know, it was, so it was something that they had over the people. And then they didn't want, you know, uh, scripture in everybody's hands. That was only for the priests. Uh, and so, you know, that was giving, what is, you know, giving scripture into the hands of the people is what? What is that doing? Giving them knowledge, right? So that they can say, hey, you know, what you're doing is wrong, and which is what Luther did, right? So this, you know, venerating the saints, you know, and, um, um, you know, praying to them and, and paying indulgences like you could buy your way uh, out of purgatory and into heaven, um, you know, uh, it, it was, Luther was disrupting all of that. And, and it really is a wonder that he wasn't put to death. Um, like Jan Hus was before him, about 100 years. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. That's a good point. And, and that's, um, you know, that's something that, that's made clear uh, in that account, I think it's John 9, with the account of the blind man and uh, the man who was born blind and he's brought before the Pharisees, right? And it's, it's they who are, you, you, you see in that account that it's they who are blind because they can't see who Jesus is because of what he just did for this man, right? And, and they can't accept this miracle and uh, that's happened and, and so forth. And so the blind man who's, who was blind and couldn't see can see much better than they, because they, he sees with the eyes of faith, right? I got a sermon coming up on that, by the way, but uh, not on that account, but on the seeing with the eyes of faith. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah, Jesse was the father of David, but that's, I don't think there's any r relationship to that other, other than he was named for Jesse. But um, uh, and then the other thing, um, the Pharisees, you know, they're worried about losing their position and that the Romans are going to come down hard on them in what happens in 70 AD. Jerusalem is destroyed. You know, hundreds of thousands of people are put to death by the Romans. 
and the temple is destroyed and the Pharisees are no more. Um, and why was that? Was it Jesus that did that? No, it was their um, uh, rejection of the Messiah when he came. That was the consequence, brought destruction to Jerusalem, right? Which is kind of foreshadowed to the destruction of, of the world um, for uh, denying the Christ and the eternal destruction. So, um, and which was, the, the temple wasn't needed anymore anyways because Jesus is here. Jesus is the temple, right? Any other thoughts or we got just about, what, five minutes, so... Uh, yeah, Laurel. Absolutely. Yeah, that's a good thought, and I didn't think about that. So the Jesus healing of Jesse also saved the brother because that Atticus was going to kill him. You know, he was going to intervene before he killed the, the magistrate and and so, um, yeah, that's a, another thing that happened. So, okay, good point. Yeah, I forget your first name again. Julie, okay, Julie Carr, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. So you were here, were you here last week when I preached on that? <laughs> no, okay. Well, anyway, yeah, so, so God does things to, to open our eyes so that, that, um, uh, that, was, that what you said? You, God does things to kind of open our eyes to who he is, right? Did I get off track there? Or? Okay, yeah, so, so and, and you know, the prophecies so that the, the false god can't take credit for it. The false gods, you know, God kind of berates them because they can't, they've never prophesied anything, right? They're just wood and stone and clay. But the Lord, every time, has, has his prophecies have come true every time. So, and of course, the greatest fulfillment has been in Jesus. So, all right. Any other thought, closing thoughts or anything? Okay, this has been fun. Um, let's go ahead and, and pray then. Heavenly Father, we do thank you. We thank you that you have revealed yourself and your love for your people through Jesus. Um, not only in the miracles that Jesus did, but the fact that he, he suffered and died for us and uh, was raised again that we might have eternal life uh, in him. Lord, bless us now as we go upon our way. May our eyes always be open to how you act uh, in our lives and in the world around us, and that we may glorify you in every way. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, everybody.